Firstly, what are indigenous knowledges? These are the knowledges of indigenous people or indigenous communities that are derived from their interactions and their interrelationships with their lived environment or what they would normally call the land. Such uh, knowledge is embedded in their culture and embodied within their practices. This knowledge is transferred from generation to generation through mainly the language which serves as the medium of transferring knowledge. I will look first at uh, indigenous knowledge using with the relationship to wildlife management. That is the harvesting of wild plants as well as hunting practices of indigenous communities. In harvesting um, wild plants, indigenous people have built into these harvesting practices sustainability aspects which are important in ensuring the availability of these indigenous plants over long periods of time and at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability. For example, in the harvesting of medicinal plants, uh, it is common practice amongst the Shona people that when you harvest back from a plant, you only harvest it from the eastern and the western side of the plant. This practice ensured that the tree or the bush was up, that was harvested was not reimbarked. And this is uh, quite important in ensuring that the plant is able to survive post the harvesting period. The same um, practice is utilized in the harvesting of fruits, where only the eastern and western side of the plant is harvested. And by so doing, roots were still left on the plant, which ensured that it did not die out. When harvesting annuals, it's common practice that people would only harvest a few of the annuals, leaving behind a representative uh, group of these annuals for the next harvesting period and also allowing for their reproduction. It is also common practice that when somebody harvests from a plant or from an area, the next herbalist or the next uh, medicinal practitioner would not harvest from the, that same plant or the same area because it was believed that in so doing they would transfer the illness that was healed by the previous uh, traditional healer into the new patient. So it was therefore taboo to harvest from where somebody has actually harvested from in the past. When harvesting wild fruit, it is, it is common practice amongst the people that they would leave behind some fruit. This ensured that this uh, was available for other people and also for wildlife. And also at the same time, some of the fruit would go onto the ground and it would become new plants. Uh, the same kinds of practices were also utilized in the harvesting of animals. For example, one common practice is taboo is the, the use of uh, totems. It is taboo for somebody to harvest a plant which is uh, their totem. Sorry, harvest a plant which is their totem and also harvest an animal which is their totem. For example, I mean the Shaba clan which is the eland and I would not harvest or eat any animal that is the eland. In that way, people would selectively hunt within the wild. It was also common practice amongst people that when they hunted a big game, they would do it uh, communally. And that therefore means that whatever meat was brought in from the hunting would be shared within the community. This ensured that everybody had meat, and at the same time it ensured that uh, they did not harvest beyond what they actually needed for that particular period. Harvesting of wildlife or hunting of wildlife was also something that was controlled by seasons. During the breeding season, it would be close season, and during the this period, 
animals would not be hunted or fishing would not be allowed to ensure that the animals were able to breed and therefore would be available for hunting in the future. This was an important practice ensuring a sustainability of wildlife in a particular area. Associated with this was also taboos uh, such as certain uh, species were not hunted. For example, it, a pangolin, which was rare, was not hunted because it was considered luck to actually come across it and it was protected in that particular way. Also certain uh, areas or certain groves were not allowed uh, to be cut down or to be harvested because they were believed to actually be sacred uh, spiritually, either as burial grounds or as areas in which people actually went to uh, relate to their ancestors. I will also look at uh, traditional agricultural practices. Within the traditional agricultural practices, indigenous people derived most of their indigenous crops from their surrounding environment. This had its own advantages in that these crops will be well adapted to the local conditions in which uh, the communities actually survive them. And these plants which are well adapted to the local conditions are becoming more useful now against the background of climate change effects. For example, plants that are adapted to dry conditions enable people to survive periods of drought. Whereas certain plants that are adapted to very wet conditions enable people to survive periods of, say, flooding in a particular area because these plants can survive long periods of wetness. While it's in the past these were grown in particular areas like the dry plants in the, more, in the dry land areas and the plants that uh, were adapted to wetter conditions in areas that are wet. This is now something that can be adapted to the seasonal variability that is associated with climate change in a particular area. Also, uh, one uh, important thing is that indigenous people have observed and adopted some of the natural arrangements of plants within um, the lived environment. And they've adapted this to their own, uh, they've adapted their these aspects into their own agricultural practices. Mixed uh, cropping or mountain cropping is a common practice amongst indigenous people. This uh, enabled them to reduce uh, pest and disease attacks and also at the same time it ensured diversity of food available, available to the, the household in a particular uh, season. This also protected them against, um, say, one particular plant species uh, being attacked or by disease or pests and being lost because the other species, of course, would then still provide uh, food for the family. These practices that the indigenous people had, including the use of uh, mixed livestock are also being adapted by adopted by a modern agricultural practices, modern ecologically sustainable agricultural practices such as permaculture, organic agriculture and ecological land use management. These aspects uh, are built into these uh, new models of agriculture. Uh, for example, they practice mixed cropping which ensure the reduction of disease. Uh, they have uh, associated plants which reduce pest attacks. They utilize manure, like the traditional people utilize manure as a source of uh, fertilizer for their fields. All these aspects are quite significantly important in uh, modern day sus environmentally sustainable agriculture as they were for traditional agricultural practices amongst the indigenous communities that we have. These traditional approaches that we have actually discussed above or indigenous uh, practices 
in wildlife harvesting and conservation in agriculture are quite significant in that they've enabled the indigenous communities to survive over a long period of time. Uh, at the same time, they've ensured sustainability of the lived environment for the indigenous communities. Uh, as the sustainability aspects have already been built into the livelihood practices of the indigenous people. The indigenous people look to the land continually uh, for their supply of their needs and reciprocally they take care of it. The knowledge that they derive from uh, their interactions with the lived environment are informing their practices on the ground which enable the sustenance of the indigenous communities themselves as well as the sustenance of the environment. Much of this knowledge is therefore embodied in indigenous people's practices as I've indicated before. As an indigenous researcher, I find that uh, indigenous knowledges can contribute significantly to environmental education and sustainability by providing examples of environmentally sustainable practices which are contextually relevant. And such practices can be drawn from indigenous people across the globe and utilized to uh, inform environmental education processes.